Let's pray together. So our Father, here we are, your children, gathered here in your presence. We pray that all that we do may glorify and honor you. Father, we're about to hear from your word. I pray that I will be faithful to it. And where I am, Father, may your Holy Spirit anoint it and use your word to help us to become more and more conformed to the image of your Son, in whose name we pray, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Take a seat. Good morning, uh, my sisters and brothers in Christ. You probably wonder who on earth I am and what I'm doing here. I'm a a part of this church, but for most of my life, I've been a pastor in, in other places. And I'm thankful to Pastor Ken. Pastor Ken, thank you for giving me this privilege to open God's Word today, especially this particular text. I think you probably asked me because you know that a part of my journey since I was really young has been spot on with the message of the book of Ephesians that we are focusing on this entire fall. So, and I want you to be on that journey with me, okay? My, my journey started when I was just 13 years old. And my family had moved from the metropolis of Beckley, West Virginia, (laughs) to the equal metropolis of Bluefield, West Virginia. It was a, a beautiful town in the Appalachian Mountains. And like Colorado Springs, it had been awarded as one of the all-American cities here in the United States by Time Magazine and by the National Civic League. And yet in spite of that, it was a very racially divided town. Now, we had a beautiful downtown at Bluefield. So one Saturday, I decided I wanted to go downtown. I was the only one home, so I had to go on my own. But for me to get to town, I went from the white part of town, you can see where I would live, I had to go through, necessarily through, the black part of town to be able to get to downtown. So I started walking. And I remember as I came to that part uh, where I crossed over into the more color-filled part of our town, I began praying. I I prayed that God would not let any of the residents there be out and about because I was terrified. It's just the way we are. I had never had a single relationship with a person of color and that creates all sorts of fear. So I was hoping I wouldn't have to have any encounters, but I'll tell you, I came around one corner and suddenly my nightmare was fulfilled. There were three African-American men sitting there laughing, doing all sorts of things. They probably saw the terror in my face and one of them turned to me and he said, "Uh, young fella, do I have some advice for you? I think you should just sit down right now with us and have a nice, cool bottle of pop. And I think you'll learn something. I think you'll learn that we're just folks. So I did. I sat down, and I did. I had a nice, cool bottle of pop, and I learned. And I learned that they were far more than just folks who I met that day were members of the Scott Street Baptist Church in Bluefield, West Virginia. And I tell you, that day, I think it was the beginning of seeing that my view of people was wrong and that my view of what God is doing in this world was far too small. So you see it, I hope. There were walls between me and those men. They were constructed by my own fear, by my own lack of understanding, walls that just began to come down that day, and it was because they loved me enough to enter into my life. They cared for me enough as a younger brother to enter into a relationship. And I'll tell you, I I now look back on that day. You can tell it's not the first time I've told this story. I look back on that day, and I know that the step I took that day was not just a step toward downtown. It was a step into the eternal plan of God. A plan of God that was established, Paul will say in the beginning of Ephesians, before the creation of the world. A plan that God has had to adopt a family into this world, an eternal family with individuals made up of people from every, Revelation 7, 9, tribe, language, and nation. Every people group, every language group, every national group, 
But for that mission of God to become a reality in this fractured world, some walls have to be seen. Some walls have to be called out, and some walls have to be taken down. Which, as I read through the book of Ephesians, is what the Apostle Paul sought to do when he wrote this book. It was to a church that he knew he had been the one who founded it, and he loved them. So I want to talk to you today about walls. You know that many walls are barriers, right? They try to keep some people out that we don't want in. (laughs) Sometimes they try to hold some people in who might want to get out. One of the most famous of those barrier walls in our history is one that I have stood on both sides of when I lived in Germany. Uh, It was the Berlin Wall. So I'm going to show you a picture of this just to try to imagine it. It was built after World War II. It was built to keep East Germans in and mostly to keep Westerners out unless we brought enough U.S. dollars and German marks. The Berlin Wall was almost 27 miles long. It was protected with soldiers, barbed wire, attack dogs, and over 55,000 landmines. So those were barriers, right? But other walls can be blessings because they can provide places of of safety and belonging. So I'm gonna show you another picture. This is of Chris in my home. My wife Chris is on the front row here. Yes, it has walls. But I'm just telling you, when it is 95 degrees plus outside in the day, it is wonderful to come out of the heat. Can I have a witness to that? And when the fierce winds arise, when the rain pours down, when the hailstorms pound us, It is a beautiful place of shelter in the time of storm. But you see here that that the walls that are there have doors. So it can be a place, if we open them, of welcome, of relationship building. I mean, if we're hospitable. Now, I don't know if you listened today as Curtis was reading God's word, but both kinds of walls are found in that text in Ephesians 2 that we have read today. I'll just show you. They're walls that are barriers, In verse 14 of Ephesians 2, Jesus Christ himself is our peace. What did he have to make peace with? Who has made the two groups, so there were walls between these groups, two groups, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So walls that are barriers, but there are also new walls that are being constructed, walls of belonging. And this is what he writes in verses 19 to 21. You are all members of God's household with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, this whole building is joined together. So let me tell you now what this sermon is about in case I'm not clear enough. God has torn down walls. He has torn down walls between people and himself and between people and people. And in tearing down those walls, he has adopted each believer in Jesus into one eternal family. He is now at work locating households, local households of this global, uh, I call it unexpected family. Uh, Not unexpected to God. This was his eternal plan. But it's unexpected as the world looks at actually who's in it. He is establishing households in which barriers are torn down. Belonging walls are built, and then he places us into geographic locations, like in Ephesus in the first century. And I think, like Colorado Springs, with this purpose, to glorify him. And we do it through our unity and through our way of life together. So let's, let's think about walls that are barriers. Jesus, when he came, had to tear down some walls. And to see that, you have to go all the way back to the very beginning of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. And as you see that, you've got to think that that church in Ephesus that had been founded and he's writing to, it was in one of the largest cities in the world, the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was located, and I've been there several times, on what is the west coast of Turkey. It was a thriving business city. There are just ruins there now, but I'll tell you, then... There was a small minority of people, of Jewish people who were there, but there were also many Gentile people who were in that church as well. 
They were coming to faith, Jews and Gentiles. And it had started, you can read it in Acts 18 and 19, when Paul himself had gone there to preach. So most of the people in that church were not, were not Jewish. They were Gentiles, like most of us. Others were Jewish, like Paul. Most of the people of wealth and influence in that city and probably in that church, they were almost certainly Gentiles. But in the church, the structures, the culture, the ways of worship, the music they sang, that was very Jewish. What seems to have happened in that church was that there were people in that church who loved Jesus, but they didn't want to be in the same church together. Let them have their own church. So Paul begins his letters, letter to the Ephesians by essentially saying, as I read it, you've got to get over this. This isn't your church. This is God's church. And what he has done, God chose us. Who's in the us? God chose us in Jesus Christ. He did it before the creation of the world. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. All those in the us who come to him, he adopts, he says, into his family with God as our father. And together, when we come together, he will say, and he says it often in Ephesians, we can be to the praise of his glory. So really... The million dollar question is who is in the us? Who is in this adopted family of God? Because there were clearly people in that church who were in God's us, but they didn't want to have in their us. Are you with me here? (laughs) So there were walls that had to come down. Well, what kinds of walls? Well, there are two kinds of barrier walls that, that Paul addresses in the letter. One, a wall between God and people. It kind of goes back to this phrase, that those who come into the family of God are going to be holy and blameless in his sight. I mean, have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, how can I be that? See, this has been a big issue. How can the only one who is holy and blameless, namely God himself, actually declare that we are holy and blameless? A, A God who has said that sin and evil, all of it has to be judged and has to be punished or there will be no justice in this world. You know that if evil proliferates, there can be no justice. How can God say that we are holy and blameless? Do you wonder about that? Well, uh, I'm glad. One, one of us. Yeah. (laughs) Pastor Tim Geller, who just passed away in New York this year, used to formulate this historic Christian way of thinking about it in, to me, a memorable way. He always would say something like this. Um, um, now, if I can only remember what he, he said, Je- Jesus, <laughs> Jesus alone lived that life that all of us should be living, holy and blameless, but none of us has. Can I have a witness here? <laughs> and then the same Jesus was willing to die the death we deserve, but he des- died it in our place so that we don't have to. This is hallelujah stuff. And Paul takes this up in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, verses 6 and 7, we come into this family through Jesus Christ. It is in Christ that we have redemption. And it comes through his blood. Through his blood we have the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Any hallelujahs here right now? Thank you, Jesus, or or something. So the... This wall between God and people is torn down for all who believe in Jesus. So again, the question, who is in the all? I'm going to take you back to verses 11 to 14. We had a sermon on this recently, and this is what we read. Listen to it. In Christ, Paul wrote, we, he's talking there about Jewish people, we were chosen in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, that we might be for the praise of God's glory. And you too, he's talking there to all non-Jews, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of Jesus, the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. You were given the promised Holy Spirit, and you too will be to the praise of God's glory. Do you see it? Anyone 
who trust in Jesus, Jews and non-Jews. That's everybody, right? Anyone who trusts in Christ is brought into God's adopted family. So that's the first barrier wall between unholy and blame-filled people and a holy God. God's torn it down through Jesus. But then, in that church, and in almost every church I've ever been to, there was another barrier, and that was between people and people. And in Ephesus, the people and people were the, were the Jews and everybody else. When Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, these two groups didn't like one another. Most Gentiles hated Jewish people. The historian Tacitus described the Jews as being the one people group that every other people group hates. So anti-Semitism was as rampant in the first century as it is in our own. But on the other side, many of the Jewish people hated Gentiles too. They called us unclean and sinful and sometimes called us dogs. In fact, in the Jewish temple, there was an inscription, a warning, that Gentile people dare not go into the holiest place. So I'm going to show you a picture of that wall, and I'll translate for you what's written there. Listen to it. No Gentile may enter within the railing barrier around the inner sanctuary and the enclosure there. Whoever is caught, he himself shall be to blame for the death that will ensue. Now that is a wall of hostility, don't you agree? <laughs> so, for that to happen, for God's eternal plan to become a, a reality in this world, walls had to come down. So I want to ask a question. What, what kinds of walls among people exist in the world that you and I live in that might keep us, might creep into our church? and keep us from becoming what God says is his eternal plan. Now, before I came here, I was working as the uh, chaplain at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. So I gathered a group of our students that I was mentoring, and I asked them that question. What are the walls that are here that will keep us from honoring God? And the discussion was rich, but also pain-filled. They talked about race and the issues we're wrestling with on our campus. Same thing was true in Ephesus. They, they talked about politics. I was doing this during an election year, 2020. They talked about socioeconomics, uh, the way they put it, the cool students and those who aren't quite so cool. Um, they had the same problem in, in Ephesus. Did you know that they had, and you can see it in Ephesians 6, both slaves and slave owners worshiping in that church? That must have been something to live out as a pastor. They talked about worship preferences that they say creates walls among generations, making it hard for us to worship together. Then they went into the more campus-based things, the wall between athletes and non-athletes, between conservatory students and non-conservatory students. So brothers and sisters, I ask you, where might we be susceptible to allowing the walls of our world to come into our church and keep us from being what God has called us to be. Whatever those walls might be, I think we all know that there is a lot at stake in a message like this one. Because Jesus himself had said that the only way that this world will look at us as Christians and even know that we're Christians at all is the love we will have for one another across those walls. John 13, 34, and 35. And then a little bit later, just before he went to the cross, we find Jesus praying for us. I pray for those who will believe in me through the message that will get to them. That's us, right? And he only prays for one thing. Father, my prayer is that they will be one as you and I are one. Why? So that the world will know that you sent me. And, he says, so that the world will know that God loves them too. So... Let me, before this turns into a dry sermon, let me get a... To deal with those walls in the church of Ephesus, what on earth was, Pastor, was Paul going to do? What he did was he just took them back to a couple of the basics of our Christian faith. So can I do that with you too? One, he gave them a reminder 
of their own human condition, their situation without Jesus. That's chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And he started with the Gentiles. Pastor Peter preached about this last week. And he said, as for you, you Gentiles, you were dead. How do you like that? You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Can't you just hear the Jewish people say, give it to them, Paul. Let those people who are worldly have it. I pastored most recently near Hollywood, and sometimes our people would take those shots at people. Give it to them, Pastor Gray. Let them have it. But Paul essentially says, no, no, no. Uh, No, he says, all of us, also lived among them at one time. We also gratified the cravings of our flesh. We too were by nature deserving of the wrath of God. That is true of us all. Amen? So what happens here, and him reminding them of that, is that pride is taken away. I really think that the thing that creates most of the walls in our world is pride. The arrogance that says, I don't want to be in a church with people like them, they're different from me, or whatever may create those kinds of walls. So he had to tear that down. We're all dead. We're all just recipients of grace. And he gave them encouragement too. You were dead, but now you are made alive in Christ. It is by grace, God's grace, that beautiful word, something we haven't earned that he gives to us. By grace, you are saved through faith, but even that's not of yourself. It is all a gift of God. Why? Lest anyone should boast. All boasting gone in heaven. So he started there. He had to get rid of the pride that created walls. Then he moved on to give them another reminder of what it cost God to bring us into this eternal family. So I want to just simply read you a little bit of what Curtis already read for us earlier in verses 11 through 18 of chapter 2. Listen to it. Remember that you who are Gentiles by birth, remember that you were without hope and and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. And then he takes on the walls between them. Jesus himself destroyed the barrier. He destroyed that dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of those two, and in one body to reconcile them both to himself through the cross. You see, they they remain Jew and Gentile. Yes, yes, he doesn't change that. But now there is something, a new identity, that transcends and envelops all of that, and that is we belong to the family of God through faith in Jesus. So how have we been brought? The wall between us and God has been torn down by the blood of Jesus. Our walls among one another are torn down through a cross. Costly. So I'll tell you, if the walls of barriers are torn down, uh, when pride is taken away, what begins to erect a whole new wall of belonging is gratitude. It's something we have all experienced, right, as believers, that we've experienced together the grace of God, and then we worship, we look forward to people, and it doesn't matter what kind of music we sing, we just want to worship together because we share, we share that common faith in Christ. And then he moved on to giving them a vision for what we can be when we live in unity. The vision that he gives them in chapter 2, verses 19 to 22 is a vision in which all the barrier walls have been eradicated, in which a one new household of God of faith will be built, one to which every human being is invited, one to which everybody can belong and find hope. And he writes in verse 22, in Christ, you all, both groups, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. And and what he's saying is when people look at us, They should see that God is here. And what he calls, what God is building, he calls us a masterpiece. That's in chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going to put you a little bit of this verse here. We often take this individualistically. He's making me into a masterpiece, and that's true. But that's not what Paul's saying here. He's saying he's making us together. He's bringing us together to be a masterpiece. The the word that, that, that is, you have that verse up there. We are God's, and my version says, handiwork. 
the Greek word that Paul used was poema. Uh, it's a word for poem. And, and really it's saying we together become his work of art. Uh, when, when people see us, they see the kind of God who makes this sort of thing. We were created in Christ Jesus, not by our works, but to do good works. So I've been thinking, what does this look like? What does this look like? So my wife, Chris, is a quilter. Maybe some of you are. But she doesn't just take uh, patterns and create. She has concepts and begins just making them. Sometimes when she makes her quilt, she has a lot of scraps. Any, any quilters here, a lot of scraps that are there? I'll show you some scraps here. here. What would you... Non-quilters, you know what I would do with those scraps? I'd throw them into the garbage. She does not. She begins a process of remaking, of design, of bringing it together, reshaping them. That's what God is doing with us. He takes messed up people like all of us, blame-filled and unholy people like all of us, begins reshaping us, remaking us, and bringing us into one family. And then when she is done, I think it is a masterpiece I think it's beautiful. And we see so much of what her creativity is all about. Bottom line, what Paul is saying, that together, when we actually live in unity together, the world sees the glory of God. Now, that word glory is a very churchy word. But it's an easy one in some ways. Its meaning here is to reflect the greatest qualities of another. The greatest qualities of Michael Jordan, I lived in Chicago a long time, were not seen on the baseball field. <laughs> they, they were seen uh, at the United Center on the basketball court. So the question, where is the glory of God to be seen in this world? Paul takes it up at the end of chapter 2, and this is what he says to him. To the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or even imagine. To him be glory. Where? Where? In Christ Jesus, he says. But not just there. Where else? In the church. You see, when people see us and who comes together into this family and what God redeeming us and remaking us and changing us, they see what he is like. And they give glory to him. So here's what my sermon is about. God has torn down walls between people and himself. And he's torn down these walls between people and people. And he has adopted each believer in Jesus into one eternal family. And right now, God is at work locating representatives of this global, unexpected, adopted family into geographical areas of this world. Households in which barrier walls are torn down. Belonging walls are being built, and he plants us in places like Ephesus and Colorado Springs. Now, what do I want you to do with this message? Well, I pray that we as a church will have a deeper longing and prayer and take steps, whatever it needs, that we can be more and more a place that welcomes all people. I mean, we were planted by Rwandans. It's, it's already in our roots, right? And I pray, and I know already our pastoral staff and our lay leadership team are committed to this as well. And, and a part, I'm just giving you a basic vision. And I want you to be sure to know that any steps in that direction, this is not just political correctness. This is not just a marketing scheme to get bigger. This is us being able to participate in the eternal plan of God. That's the first thing. But for you individually, I told you, I, I'm hoping you'll sort of take a step with me on that journey. And um, I want you to think about where you can find brokenness. Maybe it will be in your family. Maybe it will be in the community. Maybe that brokenness will be racial, like it was in, in Ephesus. Maybe it will be generational. Maybe it will be disabilities. Maybe it will be different views of sexuality. All these places. And I want you to learn from those three men that met me there in Bluefield, West Virginia, about what our responsibility is to, to be to them, to enter into their lives. As those who know that we have no pride, we were dead too, enter into their lives and uh, love them. I think, think about those men. If they hadn't entered into my life, 
There's no way in the world I'd be preaching this sermon today. Do you see that? It can make a difference. So as you think about those places, I'd like you to identify where is there a wall in our world that God might be able to use me to simply enter in and show them the love of Jesus. Now my time is is long gone, but let me give you a last word. Together, we can reflect God's glory to this fractured world. Put more simply, People in this world should be able to look at church gatherings like ours and say something like this, wow, there must be a God. <laughs> because look, look at those people who are actually worshiping together. They're black and white. They are red and blue. Can that be? They are young and old. They are men and women actually respecting one another, worshiping God together, serving in the community together. And maybe they will say, I see some people there who look a little bit like me. Maybe two. I can belong. Any step you take in that direction, it will be to your joy. And even with more certainty, I declare to you, it will be to the glory of God. Amen. Let me pray. Father, again, how much I long that I've been faithful to your word and in every respect in which I have. Use it to do your work in this church and each one of our individual lives until all walls have come down and people from every tribe and language and nation are gathered around your throne singing with one voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain for our salvation. Salvation belongs only to our God. Father, do your work so that we can participate in that great mission of yours. We pray because of and in the name of Jesus. Amen.